In May of 1986, a group of Portland, Oregon high school students, along with five adults, set off in an attempt to climb Mount Hood as part of an adventure program required by the school. The weather forecast did not look promising, but the expedition went on as planned. Sadly, deteriorating conditions and questionable decisions led to the deadliest and most senseless disaster in the history of the mountain. Good evening, my fellow citizens. We will be able to work together, to pray together. If the Japanese insist on continuing resistance, their country will suffer the same destruction as Germany. Timothy McVeigh was arrested by local authorities. Eight climbers dead. At 11,249 feet Mount Hood, an active stratovolcano stands as the tallest mountain in the state of Oregon and is a popular destination for climbers, attracting about 10,000 per year. Although it lacks the deadly elevation of mountains like K2 and Everest, technical climbing skills are required, and mountaineering gear like ice axes, ropes, and crampons are needed, and many of the major obstacles on the tallest mountains in the world, such as crevasses, falling rocks, and of course deteriorating weather, are all present on Mount Hood. Each year, around 25 to 50 people need to be rescued off the mountain, and over the years, many have lost their lives. Falls and hypothermia are the main causes of death, and the first known fatality goes all the way back to 1896, when Frederick Kern attempted to reach the summit alone. He died after a 40-foot fall caused by an avalanche. However, the most tragic day in the history of Mount Hood occurred much more recently. During the late evening of May 11, 1986, a group of 15 high school students met up at the campus of Episcopal High School to prepare to set off on a great adventure. They would enter the Cascade Volcanoes and climb one of its tallest mountains. The students were only sophomores, but at the time it was required through a program called Base Camp that all 10th graders take part in a challenging adventure where teamwork and problem solving must be used in order to succeed. For this group of 15 students, the challenge would be reaching the summit of Mount Hood. They were given some training on the techniques involved in snow climbing, such as self-arresting, using crampons, step kicking an ascent, first aid, etc. And now the day had come and each student boarded a bus which would take them to the Timberline Lodge. From there, they would head off towards the mountain. Unlike some of the tall mountains of the Himalayas, the approach was not too difficult. Along with 15 students, there were two staff members, Thomas Goman, a 42-year-old doctor, chaplain, and priest, along with Marion Horwell, the Dean of Residence and Student Affairs. Goman was an extremely intelligent and experienced mountaineer who had previous experience climbing this very mountain and was well-liked and respected by the students who would look to him for guidance. Also, one parent, Sharon Spray, would accompany her daughter, Hillary, and two more experienced climbers would serve as guides, Dee Zaduniak and Ralph Summers. So a total of 20 individuals would be making the attempt. One of the students, a girl named Tasha Amy, was blind in one eye and had only limited vision in the other, but she was determined to take part in the expedition. There was also a particularly small and skinny boy who would take part, named Patrick McGinnis. A 21st participant, Patrick Lamb, sprained his ankle just two days before the trip and was not able to make the expedition. The sprain may have saved his life. The weather forecast predicted an incoming storm that would last multiple days. That should have been all it took to postpone the expedition, but Goman believed that they could reach the summit and get off the mountain before the storm hit. It was around 3 a.m. that the team set off from Timberline. Despite Goman's well-earned reputation as an extremely intelligent man and experienced mountaineer, there were some fellow climbers who had previously climbed with him who believed that he could be overly ambitious, taking too many risks. The decision to proceed with the climb despite the weather warnings was considered by many to be reckless, as the storms of Mount Hood had a reputation of hitting very suddenly and very ferociously. Early on in the climb, the weather seemed to be cooperating, but young Hillary Spray began to develop a stomach ache and decided that she wanted to turn back. Goman tried to talk her out of it. I did experience pressure from the leaders to continue, she said. Tom Goman pressured the kids. We all assumed he knew what was best. I knew that what was best for me was to turn around and leave. Hillary and her mother Sharon did the right thing and turned back. The remaining 18 climbers continued on until at about 7,000 feet, another student, Lorca Smetana, was having cramps 
and she decided to turn back and was accompanied by another student, Courtney Boatsman. As the expedition continued with now 16, Ralph Summers, one of the guides, began to question the wisdom of continuing as the storm showed signs of approaching. He knew if the storm hit, they would all be in big trouble. Two more students decided to turn back, leaving 14. Then at around 11.30 a.m., eight and a half hours after they set off, Dee Zaduniak saved her own life by also turning around. She made that decision just in time as the storm was quickly approaching. Zaduniak made it off the mountain, but the remaining 13 continued, pressed on by Goman, who thought they were too close to the summit to turn back. However, at around 2 p.m., now at 11,000 feet and approaching the summit, the storm hit with an absolute vengeance. At first, Goman still didn't want to turn back, but Summers convinced him that every second mattered and they had to turn back immediately. Unfortunately, it was too late and the conditions deteriorated quickly. Visibility was shortened to around 20 feet and the disorienting conditions caused the group to descend off course. The small boy, Patrick McGinnis, began to slur his speech before falling over, unable to move. He was placed in the only sleeping bag they had and the group tried to huddle around him, providing whatever warmth they could. Another student, Susan McClave, who had some experience climbing, took off her boots and jacket to fit in the sleeping bag and tried to help warm up McGinnis. Summers was able to boil some water, which he gave to McGinnis with added lemon drops. After a couple of hours, the group was finally able to continue moving, but McGinnis still needed help and could not move on his own. The conditions made it hard to know in what direction they were going. Vertigo had set in, and in the whiteout conditions, the group was moving more sideways than downwards. Visibility had decreased to about 10 feet, and the winds were approaching hurricane level. Summers had everyone follow his exact footsteps, as the dangers of a fall were now at a maximum, with bridges of snow accumulating over empty spaces. One wrong step could result in a deadly fall. Finally, at around 7 p.m., Summers made the decision to construct a snow cave. It wasn't until the early hours of the following morning that Portland Mountain Rescue, PMR, was notified that there were still people on the mountain. PMR volunteer Mark Kelsey, who had summited Fort Hood hundreds of times, described the conditions as the worst he had ever seen during a rescue operation. In my whole climbing career, I never got frostbite except for that day, he said. The first day of the rescue, the winds were 103 miles per hour. The severity of the storm made it impossible to know even where to look, but the rescue workers tried anyway. Meanwhile, the snow cave was too small for 13 people and only six were able to fit inside. They had to take turns, but the body heat began to melt the surrounding snow. Breathing became difficult, and those who had to wait outside in hurricane-level winds were freezing to death. By Tuesday morning, the situation had not improved. Tom Goman was delirious and unable to count to 10. Summers knew they could not survive much longer, and along with 17-year-old Molly Shula, entered the storm to try and find help. But they had no idea what direction they were even going, and as it turned out, it was the complete wrong one. But luck was on their side, and they ran right into Mount Hood Meadows, a ski resort on the southeastern face two miles east of Timberland. The remaining 11 climbers continued to try and maintain the cave, but it proved impossible as snow continued to accumulate and conditions failed to improve. The storm was unrelenting, and another entire day had passed before, on Wednesday morning, May 14th, three bodies were found. Allison Litzenberger, Aaron O'Leary, and Eric Sandvik had perished and were the first three victims found. That day, the weather had finally relented enough to allow a helicopter to help in the search. Summers went up with the pilot to assist in the search of the snow cave. Unfortunately, hours passed and they had not found it, nor had they found any more bodies or survivors. Summers was having trouble locating the cave when Master Sergeant Richard Harder of the 304th Recovery Squadron had a hunch where it might be. Uh, we just so far have found uh, uh, three deceased individuals up there. We, uh, they might be uh, huddled down into an area, you know, in some rocks or something, and they are, uh, just haven't got up as yet, or they might be past where we're at right here and down in the treat area and we're not be able to see them. He threw out a flare to mark the area he thought the search should be concentrated on. Harder had searchers move slowly down the slope, three feet apart, and with only a few minutes left before giving up the search for the day, a rescue worker named Sergeant Charlie Eck 
came across the cave. They started digging frantically and incredibly heard moaning, meaning someone was still alive. Giles Thompson and Brenton Clark were semi-conscious and barely hanging on to life. The other climbers were too far gone, including Patrick McGinnis and the blind and courageous Tasha Amy. Tom Goldman and Marion Horwell did not survive. The other victims included students Susan McClave, Richard Hader, Eric Sandvik, Aaron O'Leary, and Allison Litzenberger. In total, seven students and two staff members had perished. Helicopters rushed the survivors to the hospital. Thompson was nowhere near out of trouble and went into cardiac arrest. His chest needed to be opened and heart massaged by hand. Both legs had to be amputated and it took months before Giles Thompson could be confirmed as an official survivor. Doctors credited his solid preparation in wearing a pair of rubber and wool pants. They did not save his legs, but likely saved his life. Brenton Clark also survived and went on to attend Stanford and then medical school in San Francisco. In the aftermath, an official report assigned most of the blame to Goman, who pushed common sense beyond its boundaries and failing to turn back with a massive storm incoming. Lawsuits were filed, settlements were produced, and the newspapers and media were all over the tragedy for a week or two before other news took over the headlines. Richard Hader's father, Richard Sr., called the expedition a death march and base camp, which has since been discontinued, a quote-unquote disastrous killing program. The school continues to commemorate the event and honor those lost each year in May. This event was by far the most tragic and senseless mountaineering disaster to occur involving miners in the history of North America. Although the base camp program makes sense in helping teach teamwork and overcoming adversity, common sense dictates that sending young students with little to no real mountaineering experience off to climb an 11,000 foot mountain on which hundreds have died is not a great idea, especially when you consider the impending bad weather. The only comparable disaster would be the 1971 Kerrgorms disaster, which I've also made a video on. Obviously, the powers that be at Episcopal High School either were not aware of that incident or learned nothing from it. Rest in peace to the nine students and two adults who lost their lives on Mount Hood in 1986. I couldn't imagine a more horrific way to die and I hope something like this never happens again, especially to young students who are only following the lead of the older adults. Thank you for checking out today's video. Please feel free to check out my playlist on mountaineering disasters as well as my channel, which contains various historical videos and stuff that happened. Feel free to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed the content and we will talk to you in the next video.